Weather forecasting is now a multi-billion pound global industry. With British companies investing heavily in meteorological information to make their businesses weatherproof. We didn't get the weather forecast uh, predicted right very, very quickly. Um, you could have empty shelves and very disappointed customers. And one of the world leaders is the UK's very own Met Office. Weather forecasts really are essential to the running of the UK. Now, for the first time in their 160-year history, they're opening their doors to reveal that there's so much more to the Met Office than giving us our daily forecast. There is nothing that the weather really doesn't touch in everything that we do, because the weather is awesome. And this time, as one of the hottest autumns on record hits Britain, Met Office forecast will be critical for the Red Arrows. I'm constantly assessing the weather to try and get the best display that I can. Warm weather plays have on the supermarket shelves. A lot of these crops have grown on large than what we'd expect them to do. And the meteorologists go sky high in search of snow. Three, two, one, release. It's the 1st of December. OK, morning, everyone. And as far as the Met Office is concerned, it's officially the end of autumn. Things are set appropriately enough for the first week of, of winter to turn colder. We're expecting some widespread frosts, uh, potentially down to minus five or minus six, for instance, over central parts of the country. Well, today is the start of winter in the meteorological calendar, which means lots of interest about what it's going to be like over the winter period. The Met Office like their seasons to start on the first day of the month for statistical reasons, although some members of the public disagree. It is not the first day of winter, it is the 21st. Go on the planet, not your own guidelines. Winter starts on December 21st, always has. Stop with this American rubbish. <laughs> as well as day-to-day -day forecasting, seasons are important to the Met Office and its clients because for any business to survive, they need to know what the weather might throw at them weeks and months in advance. But in Britain, we have one of the most variable climates in the world. We're at a crossroads of all sorts of atmospheric things. We're by great big ocean, which is warm all year round. We're next to the continent, which heats up in the summer and cools down in the winter. But we're also um, at the crossroads in the high atmosphere of the cold air from the poles and the warm air from the tropics. So Depending on which way the wind blows, our weather will change, and it can change really dramatically. Understanding those changes is at the heart of the Met Office's business. But it would appear that recently, the seasons are becoming more extreme. The last three months have proved particularly perplexing. But for the Met Office, summer ended with a classic conundrum. What would it be like on the August bank holiday? Good afternoon, you're to the Met Office. Bonnie speaking, how can I help? The weather desk is the public face of the Met Office, answering the nation's queries and concerns. People like to complain um, if it's been raining, like, why is it raining? People think that we can do something about it and that we can just uh, flick a switch and stop the rain, but it's not really how it works. The weather desk is open round the clock normally taking around 300 calls a day. Right. The bank holidays are one of their busiest times. I've had a customer uh, tweet about the weather in viewed uh, for uh, Monday as uh, there's an event on and at the moment it's looking like it might be a wet one. But there are concerns about the bank holiday weather closer to home. Just 15 miles from Met Office HQ, in the small town of Dawlish, they're preparing for their ninth annual air show. Guest stars, the RAF Red Arrows aerobatic display team. To use a weather analogy, it's the calm before the storm. Today, from 12 o'clock until 5 o'clock, we have a whole afternoon of flying. There will be, on a day like this, probably upwards of 80,000 people here today. Weather could make or break the whole event. It's looking fine enough now, but the next few hours could be critical. Bad weather could ruin the show and slash the donations the event relies on. Don't think people huddling under umbrellas in the rain and possibly flying being cancelled is conducive to them putting their hands in their pockets and donating. You probably wouldn't blame them, to be honest. The impact could be that serious. Bad weather could mean no show next year. 
The Met Office supplied data to the whole of the RAF. And as the stars of the show prepared to take off at Exeter Airport, clouds are beginning to appear on the horizon. A day like today at Dawlish, late August, we've got um, fairly unstable weather. The Red Arrow's pilots rely on a combination of Met Office data and on-the-ground observations. Number two now, you're following the DA-42. Every half an hour, then we'll carry out a weather observation. And we'll input that, and that gets uh, sent to the Met Office, and it gets sent out on a radio frequency for the aircraft to listen to, so they know what the weather is before they take off or land. The team have a choice of three aerobatic displays of varying complexity. Which one they will fly depends on the current weather. Really, I'm constantly assessing the weather conditions, the cloud, the visibility, and the wind to try and get the best display that I can. Conditions on the ground are perfect. But up in the air, it's a different story. With invisible thermals and changing wind directions at different heights. If Red One feels the weather is closing in, he may be forced to scale back the performance mid display. Red Heart, please, boss. It's uh, light and variable. During the display, we have uh, Red 10. He's the commentator and ex-Red Arrows pilot. And he also lets me know uh, what the wind is doing. Copy, boss. 1016. The wind is 3105. And the wind is very, very important to what we do. Travelling at 400 miles an hour, the plane's just six feet apart. Every tiny detail counts. Red 10 uses a handheld weather station to provide precise local wind readings that ensure safety on the ground. Yeah. Uh, the weather's been fantastic, lots of blue sky, lots of sunshine. It's attracted so many people to come out. They are literally here in their tens and tens of thousands. In the end, over a hundred thousand people crowded into Dawlish on the day, ensuring that the coffers are full for next year's show. It would have been a different story two days later. Monday was one of the coldest, wettest August bank holidays in the world. Autumn started for the Met Office on the 1st of September. And after the bank holiday weekend, the warm weather returned and stayed through September, October and into November. We've got that mild air over us, so 12, 13 degrees, possibly even a 14 or 15. The autumn doesn't seem to get any colder. In Halloween, of course, it was the uh, warmest ever Halloween has ever been, with uh, temperature reaching 23 and a half degrees, which is uh, almost unprecedented. As November arrives, the unseasonal weather is now giving the high school a massive headache. Weather was actually um, highlighted in a recent retailer report as being the third biggest impactor on retailers' performance. Consumers decide what they're going to do, where they're going to shop, what they're going to buy, based on what the weather's doing. The problem for fashion stores is that customers don't reach for winter woolies until they feel temperatures plunging. Nobody's really going out to buy anything. Like, I haven't bought any jumpers this year or anything. I was wearing exactly the same thing right now as I was in the heat, heat wave in the summer. So, faced with a long, mild autumn, the sales have started early as stores' profits suffer and shoppers pick up a buck. And it's not only affecting what we wear, but what we eat too. Crop cycles depend on seasons to affect the growth. Um, and if there's a change in those cycles, then that will in turn affect the growth of the farmer's crops. In Suffolk, co-op supplier Ian Hall produces 80,000 tonnes of carrots, Britain's favourite root veg, each year. Our whole life revolves around the weather. What the mild autumn has done is has created ideal conditions for growth. So a lot of these crops have grown on larger than what we'd expect them to do. This isn't good news, because when it comes to carrots, size does matter. They even photograph 170,000 veg per hour to make sure they are the right dimensions. In the busy run up to Christmas, consumers are prepared to pay extra for the convenience of bread. Diameter to fit into the if they're too big, 
they can end up being sold at a cheaper price, which will be bad news for Ian. So, to beat the mild weather, this seasoned farmer has had to mobilize his carrot picking team two weeks earlier than he planned. Thanks to his judgment, he has just scraped through. Obviously, a little bit larger than we normally see, potentially, but um, for the pre pack, the size is, is perfect. Back at the Met Office, the meteorologists have been crunching numbers, and they've now confirmed that the autumn weather has been very unseasonal. We've had the third or warmest autumn on record, which, which is unusual and interesting. They think mild autumn isn't just a statistical blip. There's something bigger going on. Temperatures are on average around half a degree warmer, but when that happens, you can also find that that atmosphere can hold more moisture. So going along in tandem with it is that we're seeing more rainfall as well. And these changes are even affecting our travel plans. Every autumn, falling leaves cause delays to our railways. It's a major commuter grumble. It's just really frustrating because you think leaves on the line, you know, that, that's something that's inevitable. It seems to be like a standard excuse. So it's not the real reason. It's not just a mystery. Leaves are a very real threat, and the current mild autumnal weather is making it worse than usual. The fact that the trees are so close to the track means that any leaves that fall off, they're going to fall straight onto the track, and it's stuff that we, we have the problems with. It's such a problem for network work that they spend £40 million each autumn cleaning up their 20,000 miles of track. They even employ their very own tree specialist. When these get picked up and stuck between the wheels and the rails, the increase in pressure, the increase in temperature at that railhead then bakes this into a black, hard paste on top of the rail. It's almost like Teflon or black ice. It's, it's just a non-stick thing. The, the trains just, the wheels lock up and the trains will slide. But it's not just braking that's a problem. In Network Rail's York Control Room, leaves on the line can make trains disappear. Essentially, every train that operates on the network has got a specific, what they call head code, which is a train reporting number. When the wheels make contact with the train, the train sends a signal to its location. And when the rail is the the signal is broken. The train disappears from the screen. If this train was to disappear, it wouldn't appear on here. It would reappear somewhere here. And what it would mean is that essentially we can't run any trains between that location and that location until we know the other one's got out the other end. This causes delays every year. But the mild autumn means it's going on for longer. It's now mid-November and there are still plenty of leaves on the trees because it takes a good cold snap to bring them down. Frost gets between where the, the leaf joins onto the twig. It's where it's going to break off. You get the frost in there, it almost pushes it off, makes it looser, and then that leaf will fall off. The leaves even have their own weather forecast, which Network Rail gets from one of the Met Office's main rivals. Meteor Group sends over the Rail Adhesion Index twice daily. It shows how slippery the rails have been made by leaf fall. Friday, we've got our first reds of the week, and there's a red, which is a six adhesion index, which is towards the poor scale. The red alert means they will need to take action to avoid train delays. Network Rail's got the ultimate weapon, a battalion of 120 railhead treatment teams. Today, one of the locomotives is off on a 400-mile leaf-busting mission around the Ah, hello, ladies. It's the driver of 3 Sierra 2 at Church Fenton. Well, leaves are probably a driver's worst nightmare. Without us running, the leaf mulch would just build up on the rail, and it would lead to pretty much the whole network would just grind to a halt. This train will be out for about 19 hours. They're running every night, largely unseen by the commuters. This monster machine removes the leaf residue using high pressure water. Clean rails are then coated with a mix of sand, aluminium, and energy. By morning, these tracks will be cleaned up and protected, 
solving the problem before it's even happened. I think it's fair to say we are the heroes of the railway. By the end of November, it's not just companies that are longing for the seasons to behave themselves. The meteorologists have also been frustrated by the months of mild, uneventful conditions and are keen for something to get their teeth into. It's almost been boring, actually. But there could be change on the horizon. Scotland, a state-of-the-art research jet, is about to fly into snow clouds forming off the coast. It's the first week of winter, about to reset the seasons. It's the first week of December. Good morning, Metaface. Johnny speaking. And expectations are high for some seasonal weather. The weather desk is now dealing with a weather-obsessed great British public, wanting to know if they can break out their sledges. The bookies themselves will ring us up and ask us, um, what's the chance of uh, white Christmas? People like the seasons to behave as they should. So as soon as you get that slightly colder weather or a chance for snow, um, people get very excited. It's the 1st of December in Birmingham. It's the 1st of December everywhere else as well. <laughs> and there's no snow. When's it scheduled for? It's not just the public who are excited by the prospect of an interesting turn of events. The meteorologists live and breathe the weather. And that calling comes early. <laughs> I think if you were to ask anybody in the Met Office, they would be really passionate about what they do. How I got into it was when my, um, my dad got me a weather station for Christmas, actually, um, and uh, it was at the age of uh, five. I grew up in a place called Fort William in the West Highlands of Scotland, and uh, weather was really driven into me from a young age. When I saw the first heavy snowfall when I was five or six, I wondered why that was happening, and uh, I wrote to the Met Office when I was about 12. They replied to me saying what qualifications you needed to work here, and uh, very unusually, I've actually followed that plan almost to the letter. You often see people walking out of the building just looking up at the sky, because the weather is awesome. The Met Office has one of the most qualified workforces in Britain. All budding meteorologists need a degree to start. In physics, maths and geography the most common. Because we're all interested in the dynamics of the atmosphere and all the rest of it, each situation is different. I mean, that's the good thing about this job. And December is now shaping up to test their skills to the limit. We're looking at a potential cold plunge. A blast of cold weather is making its way across the Atlantic. Working out what it will mean for the UK is tricky. Sometimes it's, it requires a bit of forensic examination of exactly what's going on to piece together how things are going to happen, the interactions between the high levels and the low levels. The meteorologists are increasingly confident that Britain's about to see its first snow of the year. Hello again. Well, winter is here, and for many of us, it'll be a pretty cold night. Our four-day forecast is accurate now as our one-day forecast was, you know, 40 years ago. But all weather forecasts have a margin of error. And snow can be hard to predict with certainty because most clouds are already made of frozen water droplets. It's what happens to them as they leave the cloud that determines whether they end up as rain or snow. Most of our precipitation starts as some kind of frozen precipitation and then melts as it reaches the ground. And it's all dependent on the temperature at ground level such a tiny difference in the temperature can mean the difference between rain, sleet or snow. But for some, snow can't come soon enough. Glencoe in the Highlands is Scotland's oldest and biggest ski resort. This family business has 19 different runs. Now, the slopes are empty. Our business is hugely vulnerable to the weather. If we have no snow, we basically have no work for all our seasonal staff and we have 40 or 50 seasonal staff who work with us every winter. But until the snow comes, all Andy can do is wait. Luckily for him, the Met Office are still confident of the upcoming snow. But they're constantly testing and improving their forecast to increase accuracy. The meteorological world now has a tool that can help to forecast how and when snow forms more accurate. A team of researchers boards one of the most sophisticated bits of kit in its arm, a multi-million pound state-of-the-art airborne laboratory. Taking off from Glasgow, 
the BAE-146 will skim 100 feet above the sea and soar through clouds up to 30,000 feet, taking thousands of measurements as it goes. So I'm in charge of uh, throwing these out of the aircraft. Flying straight into the snow clouds to the west of Scotland, they will fire probes from the jet. At the end of the tube, there's a parachute. What we do is we actually put it in this tube here, like this. That goes in there, and then the captain gives us a countdown, and we actually pull this lever, a hatch opens on the outside of the aircraft, and it gets sucked out. And stand by. Three, two, one, release. Data from the probe will help them further understand how differences in conditions can determine whether a cloud drops rain or snow. We've got plots of wind direction, wind speed, relative humidity and air temperature all coming through um, directly to the aircraft. So this is really good to, to give us sort of a, a sort of snapshot of what the atmosphere is like directly underneath us. All this information will be fed back into the supercomputer at the Met Office's Exeter HQ and compared with previous forecasts. It's a constant process of refining and adding to the pool of shared knowledge. It means that year by year, the snow plane is helping to improve the accuracy of our weather forecasts. And this gives you actual data, so it's a really, really valuable tool for checking that we're getting it right. Which is all very well. One question people are asking on the ground is, will it snow? I certainly expect over some of the higher ground in Scotland uh, there will be snow showers with the sorts of clouds that we were looking at today. But will it be enough and in the right place for Andy and his Glencoe Ski Resort? Just arriving at the ski centre just now and uh, there's snow on the roads and hopefully this is the omens for a, another great ski season. Forecast has delivered, and now a busy winter beckons. Snow's falling quite heavily at the moment, uh, and it's looking good for the rest of the season. Finally, after months of disconcertingly unseasonal conditions, it looks as if the weather is beginning to behave itself. Well, it certainly seems as though we're going to see our first taster of winter, which uh, coincides with the meteorological start of winter. Ooh, finally getting seasonal. Next time, Britain braces itself as a weather bomb detonates. People are thinking it's an actual bomb. Whilst the Met Office tried to reassure a concerned public. I'm a very worried lady about the winter. And the meteorologists have an £80,000 gamble as they grapple with icy roads and torrential rain. You're never too sure of actually what's going to happen.